Hello, everyone. Welcome to Edu Made Easy. We offer a collection of free resources for IGCSC and checkpoint exams. For more information, please visit www.edumadeeasy.com. Today, we're going to be solving the Chemistry 0620 paper 32 for the May and June 2023 series. Let's get started. Okay, so uh, question one says figure 1.1 shows part of the periodic table. Answer the following questions using only the elements in figure 1.1. So only the ones they have speci specifically mentioned here. Each symbol of the element may be used once, more than once, or not at all. First uh, one says give the symbol of the element that forms 21% vo volume of clean, dry air. So if you look clearly, um, we have a composition of clean, dry air, right? So we have 21% of something, 78% of something, and also the remainder is a mixture of some things. So 21% would definitely be oxygen. 78% is gonna be our nitrogen. Remainder is gonna be a mixture of carbon dioxide and noble gases. So that's, good. that's gonna be the three things you have to know for the composition of clean, dry air. So we would write uh, just O here for the symbol of the element. Don't write oxygen, write only the symbol as they've stated. What's the element that has an atom with only three occupied electron uh, shells? That means um, it has like, uh, I guess, two electrons in the first shell and then eight fully in the second and then eight again in the third. So the only one here I would say, so it has to be obviously in period three, right? So the only element here in period three is gonna be chlorine. So it has to be chlorine. Next question asks, what is the element that has an atom with only one electron in its outer shell? So again, uh, this is gonna be something from group one, right? Because group number suggests the number of electrons in its valence shell. And if there's only one electron, that means it's in group one. So it corresponds like that. The only element in group one we have is potassium. So let's write K. And remember this is, so this is for group number. This is talking about group number. This is talking about period number because period is the number of occupied electron shells. So if you have three would be in period three. What's the element that is a gray black solid at room temperature? So that's going to be iodine here. Whenever you kind of see a very specific color, it's going to be your halogens. So chlorine is a pale yellow green gas at room temperature and pressure. Bromine is a red brown liquid at room temperature and pressure. Iodine is going to be your gray back, black solid at room temperature and pressure. So it's going to be iodine I. What element forms an ion that gives a green precipitate on addition of aqueous ammonia? So this is your testing of cations, which you have to know. Uh, when you're adding aqueous ammonia, the only one here that's going to turn green is going to be your chromium here. So this is, again, just something you have to know. So there's a lot of memorizing in especially the test. So that's unit 12, experimental chemistry. And lastly, what's the element that is used in electrical wiring because of its good ductility? That's going to be your copper. So kind of the three uh, metals we have mentioned in that part is aluminum. Aluminum has three kind of uses in airplanes because of its low density, in food containers because it's resistance to corrosion. And also I think it's overhead electrical cables because of its low, sorry, is it density? I think it is low density. And then we have copper. And then I think that should be it. So those two, you just have to know, this is gonna be copper. Next question says, table 2.1 shows properties of the halogens. Use the information in table 2.1 to predict, firstly, the boiling point of iodine. So we can see that the um, overall trend here, although not, you don't really have to know it in, I think, core, but they've given a table here so we can clearly see the relationships. Um, the boiling point is what? It's increasing, right? It's increasing down the group. So the boiling point of iodine should be between, let's say, uh, I would do about 115 to 335. So this would be your acceptable range 
why not 60? Because that's right after bromine. That's not how it works. Um, you can't simply choose something like 60 because you have to see the gap between these two as well. So that's an enormous gap, right? So what is that? Let me just take my calculator. Let's see what the gap is between. So that's um, that's going to be 94. So you want 59 plus 94, you're going to get 153. So that would be my first answer. Uh, like you can't just straight go 60. Check the difference between these two and then you can get the next uh, well, ID in the burning point. So this is the acceptable range, but using the method of calculating the difference between here and adding it again, you would get 153, which is totally acceptable as well. Okay. Next question, uh, next part says the density of acetatine at room temperature and pressure, what it is, we have to predict it. So we again see here that the density increases down the group, right? So again, let's see. Uh, now it can be more than 4.93, but not 4.94, something like that. What we're going to do is that we're going to find the difference between this. So 4.93 minus 3.12, which is 1.81, and just add that to the 4.93. We would get 6.74 as our answer. And that is a totally acceptable answer. The range is, is from 4.95 to 16. So that is a range given. So there's no, sorry, it's 15. There's no specific answer because you're predicting. Okay, uh, next part says, what is it? Uh, predict the physical state of bromine at plus 50 or positive 50 degrees. Give a reason for your answer. So the physical state of uh, bromine of 50, if yeah. we see... Uh, one video. <laughs> okay, so we have to predict the physical state of bromine at 50 degrees Celsius. So bromine, okay, so what I like to use is, I have to use a kind of diagram, you could say. So it shows how the state changes if you're using the boiling point and melting point of any element. So what would you have first for the, um, I think it's, melting point below your melting point what would you have you would have your solid above you would have your liquid and then for boiling point below you would have your liquid above you would have your gas so this basically means that um, uh, below the melting point of any substance it would be a solid above the melting point it would be a liquid right and then for boiling point any um well, any number below the boiling point would be a liquid. Any number be, uh, above the boiling point would be a gas. So the boiling point of bromine is plus 59. So let's just write it here. So if it was 50, that means it has to be lower than, um, lower than 59, right? So what state would it be? It would simply be a liquid. So that's how you can use this diagram to figure out what state it is using their melting points and boiling points. So the physical state is liquid. And the reason why you have to say that 50 uh, Celsius is between, you have to say it's uh, between the melting point. You can say it's above the melting point and below the boiling point. So it's above the melting point, but below the boiling point is above the melting point but it's below the boiling point that's how you use that diagram uh, to figure out the state of it at like a specific temperature okay so it says aqueous bromine reacts with aqueous potassium iodide complete the weird equation for this reaction so this is yet another displacement reaction. So we have to specifically see if bromine is more reactive than iodine. And it is because remember in halogens group, what happens to the reactivity down the group? It decreases, right? So bromine is going to be more reactive than iodine, meaning it's going to displace iodine to make potassium bromide and then just iodine. 
sorry these should be the well switched because this has two two lines but yeah iodine potassium bromide is the correct answer explain why aqueous iodine does not react with aqueous potassium bromide so again look at the fact that iodine cannot displace bromine from its halide ions so simply why because it's less reactive than bromine. So you're going to write iodine is less reactive than bromine. Next, we have to describe a test for iodide ions. So this is going to be adding what uh, your silver nitrate specifically. Uh, I, I mean, you can say acidify with dilute nitric acid, but it's a bit common for everything. So Usually they don't give a mark for that. So something specific like you only have to add silver nitrate for this test specifically, right? So just say add silver nitrate and then the observation would obviously be a yellow precipitate. As we know, the color gets darker down the group. That's why chlorine would have a white precipitate. Sorry, let me highlight. Chlorine would have a white, bromine would have a cream precipitate, iodine would have a yellow like that so this is how you do that page next we have water from natural uh, sources can contain metal compounds and phosphates name two other substances found in water which are harmful to aquatic life so two you can definitely think of is plastics which is probably the most main thing other than that you can say i think sewage sewage is also acceptable answer. and you can also say harmful microbes so this is, I think, unit 10, I'm not sure, but basically it's all about water and like the harmful and the beneficial substances. State why phosphates are harmful to uh, aquatic life. So phosphates, although they're a very important mineral ions we need to live in the aquatic life systems, they can actually deplete oxygen from the water. This is called eutrophication, although it's not in uh, in like detailed in the chemistry syllabus, it definitely is in the biology 0610 syllabus. So if you do that, you will obviously know more about that than doing chemistry. But um, simply it's because it's depletion of oxygen in the water. This is the, the, um, the, uh, the overall result. So table 3.1 shows the masses of ions in milligrams present in a thousand centimeter cube sample of polluted water. Answer these questions using information from table 3.1. It says name the positive ion present in the highest concentration. So the highest concentration would be the highest number here. That's going to be what? Potassium. So let's write potassium. We name it. So potassium ion. Name, uh, sorry, state the name of the NO3 minus ion. So again, this is a, uh, what do you call this? Uh, what do you call the ions like this? I forgot the name. But uh, basically, I genuinely forgot the name. But um, these are the type of ions you have to know. I might have mentioned it in another video. But just know NO3 minus is going to be nitrate. Calculate the mass of magnesium ions present in 250 centimeter cube of polluted water. So let's see mass of magnesium ions. This is in thousands. So we simply what? We just have to. So if this is. If 0 0.6 is in thousand centimeter cube to make it 250, how do we do that? We simply think divided by four, right? So zero point six divided by four, we would get sorry, that's thousand divided by four is two fifty. Polluted water. Sorry, it's one point. Oh my god. 1.6, 1.6 divided by 4 is going to be 0 0.4. That's your correct answer. Sorry about that. And that's why you have to read the question carefully. Water is produced when blue copper to sulfate is heated. 
So we have the blue copper to sulfate shown by the water crystallization. This is the water molecules present in a hydrated substance. We call this water of crystallization. This is also a definition. I think it's only in the extended, but do check your syllabus to check if it's in core extended or both. Uh, copper sulfur, we, we got white because it's anhydrous. And then we just got some five moles of water. Describe how white copper sulfate can be changed back to blue. It can be simply done by adding water. So that's what makes it blue, the hydrated part of it. Choose a word from the list which best describes white copper to sulfate. So this is the word I used before, the fact that it's anhydrous, so it doesn't have any water. Complete the symbol equation for the reaction of calcium with water. So you have some filling in the balancing equation and also the products. So this is essentially metal plus water. What do you get as the other product in a metal plus water? We'll get hydrogen. And now to balance it off, we have two here. So we're going to have to have two in the front of water as well. And that would balance it off. Okay. This question is about chlorine and compounds of chlorine. Chlorine has diatomic molecules. Define the term diatomic. So when we say diatomic, chlorine is di diatomic, we mean it's written as Cl2. It doesn't exist as Cl. Like there's no such thing as just Cl. Like it doesn't exist. So it is always in Cl2. All of the other halogens also exist as diatomic. So F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. And I said, I'm not too sure because it's not in the syllabus, but I'm guessing it is from the trains with the others. So the diatomic means basically just two atoms. One molecule of chlorine contains two atoms. Because this essentially means Cl times Cl contains two atoms. That's basically your um, definition. Deduce the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in the chloride ion shown. So whenever you have an ion, the first thing you have to do is just write the uh, proton number because that's not going to change. Chlorine originally is just 17. Electrons, since this is minus, you're going to have to add one. So it becomes 18. Neutrons, then you're going to do 37 minus, minus either protons. So 37 minus 17 is going to be 20. So what did I do here? I did the uh, what mass number minus the protons. Because protons plus neutrons makes the mass number, right? Chlorine reacts with hydrogen to produce hydrogen chloride. The reaction is exothermic. State the meaning of the term exothermic. So exothermic basically means we're releasing energy to the surrounding, where it's a reaction that transfers thermal energy to the surrounding. So basically giving out thermal heat to the surrounding. A reaction that gives out or transfers thermal energy to the surroundings. While endothermic would be absorbing all the energy. So it will be transferring from the surroundings to the whatever the reaction is. Figure 4.1 shows an incomplete reaction pathway diagram for a reaction with chlorine and hydrogen. Complete figure 4.1 by writing this formula in the diagram. So this is relatively easy because we don't have to really put any activation energy or... Um, enthalpy change sign, but we just have to put the uh, reactants and products. So in an exothermic reaction, the um, reactants always have more energy than the products because what? They're losing energy to the surroundings, right? So just remember, let's say this is my inside my reaction and this is outside my reaction, so the surrounding. So energy is being lost because it's going to the transfer, thermal energy is being transferred to the surrounding. So what would have more energy to start with? The reactants, right? So this is going to be our reactants here. And our products would have less, less energy because it's given out to the surroundings. 
Next question asks, uh, explain how figure 4.1 shows that the reaction is exothermic. So I kind of already said this, but the fact that the energy of the gray, uh, energy of the reactants is greater than the energy of the products. So the energy of reactants is greater than energy of product. Like that, you can write it down. A few drops of methyl orange indicator are added to dilute hydrochloric acid. So this is going to be your classic uh, indicator question. And what is the uh, color of the solution? So adding it to acid. So it's going to be what? It's going to be either red or you can say pink. So it's going to be very like bright, very bright red, orange, that kind of. Uh, color. Dilute hydrochloric acid reacts with sodium hydroxide. So what do we call these reactions? We call it a neutralization reaction because we have an acid and a base. So what do we always get as like one of our known products? We always get water. Sorry, don't write H2O, write water. I think like since I'm so used to writing like the chemical formula, like I don't think there's ever like word equations in paper four. But this is pretty good. This is well, much more easier, yes. So then how would we get the salt? It would be sodium chloride. Okay. Sodium hydroxide is an alkali and write the formula of the ion present in all alkalis. So what distinguishes an alkali is the OH minus ion. For an acid, it's going to be the H plus ion. So these are the two ones you have to know when acids and bases. So this is this page. Wow, next we have some electrolysis. So figure 4.2 shows the apparatus used for the electrolysis of concentrated aqueous sodium chloride using graphite electrodes. So we know graphite and platinum both are used as inert, so they don't affect the products of the electrolysis. You have to label this diagram to show the anode and the electrolyte. So the anode, anode is always the positive cathode. So the anode we're going to do over here. Remember, do not draw an arrowhead because Cambridge doesn't allow that. You're simply just going to draw a line that touches the anode like this and make sure it clearly you write it here. The electrolyte is going to be your liquid here. Sorry, don't point. Yeah, just point in the middle. That's probably the safest thing. So electrolyte. Like that, you can write it down. Name the products and state the observations at the positive and negative electrodes. Okay, so what do we always do? We always dissociate the ions first. That's our first step. They have sodium chloride. It's aqueous. We'll have the addition of H plus and OH minus. Now, what's going to reduce always the least reactive, and that's always, mostly always hydrogen, except if there's copper, obviously. And here, we have a concentrated halide ion being Cl minus, so that will oxidize instead of OH minus. So let's write the ionic half equations for practice as well. So what at the cathode is going to be H plus. Mm, okay. So it's going to be H plus plus two electrons. I think it's like this. Yeah. And then at the anode, it's Cl minus. Like this. Sorry, you have to write gas here. So that's going to be your ionic half equation. Okay. Um, sorry. Now the products are the positive electrode. What's a positive electrode? Your anode, what is it going to be? It's going to be chlorine. So let me just write that. Observation. So chlorine, often they want you to say that it is a green gas. So make sure to write that. As you already know in the periodic table unit that chlorine is a pale yellow green gas. Correct with the negative electrode, which is our cathode. We're going to say hydrogen. And hydrogen is a colorless gas, so you can't comment on its color. But you can state the fact that it bubbles, right? So just say bubbles. That's acceptable. So this is how you do this. This question is about metals. 
Carbon is used to extract iron from iron ore in a blast furnace. Name the main ore of iron. So often students get confused between bauxite and hematite. All remember hematite is belonging to iron ore, while bauxite is the aluminum oxide or aluminum ore. Iron 3 oxide is the iron ore in reduced by, which is reduced by carbon monoxide. Name the two substances which react in the blast furnace to produce carbon monoxide. So this is uh, carbon and carbon dioxide because, let's see, because basically this plus this plus this gives you two CO. That's how you write the chemical equation. Iron rusts in the presence of oxygen and water. State one method of preventing rusting. So I think in total there's about four, which I mentioned in the syllabus. There's what galvanizing with zinc. There's painting. There's plastic, so coating with plastic. And there's also what greasing. So one of these will be totally good. Table 5.1 shows some information about the reaction of four metals with steam. And then they've given us the reactions. Put the four metals in order of their reactivity which the le with the least reactive metal first. So from uh, the looks of it, since silver has literally no reaction, that's definitely going to be the last. I uh, think we should write the name. Silver. Silver. Done. Let's see what is like the next uh, more reactive than silver. I would say it's beryllium. Actually, chromium because it reacts on slowly only when the metal is very hot. Beryllium, whatever the temperature reacts slowly. So, but chromium needs that extra support. So it's going to be just our, after silver and then after would be beryllium. And then obviously it would be magnesium, which is very reactive indefinitely. Okay, so it can be a bit confusing with beryllium and chromium, but just understand that chromium only reacts slowly. Like it literally only reacts when the metal is very hot. So it has that extra condition, but beryllium reacts slowly, whatever the temperature is. So that means it's more reactive than chromium. A student investigates the reaction of different size pieces of calcium carbonate with dilute hydrochloric acid. Sizes of the pieces of calcium carbonate are large, medium, and small. All other conditions stay the same. Table 6.1 shows the time taken for each reaction to finish. So we have here, complete table 6.1 by writing the size of the pieces of calcium carbonate in the first column. So we know in a rated reaction, we know increased surface area means increased rate of reaction. However, they haven't specifically mentioned the word surface area, but they've given us large, medium, small. Just know that for a piece to be increased surface area, it has to be the smallest as possible. So for it to be the smallest to be possible, and if it's increased surface area, that means it would have been the fastest. Fastest time here is 50 seconds, meaning that the smallest pieces are here. And then 160 is like the middle time, so that would be medium. And the slowest of them all is the large, which would have taken the longest because it had the lowest surface area. That's how you correlate surface area with the actual size because they often don't mention specifically like, oh, the size of this calcium carbonate had an increased surface area. They've just, they would just say, oh, it's small, it's large, it's medium, like that. So that's how we correlate. Increase surface area, meaning the smallest size possible. Describe the effect on the time taken for small pieces of calcium carbonate to finish reacting with dilute hydrochloric acid when the temperature in is increased, while all other conditions stay the same. So when we increase temperature, what obviously happens is less time is taken for the reaction to occur. So it happens faster. And now we do the effect on the time taken for small pieces of calcium carbonate, finish reacting with dilute hydrochloric when the concentration is decreased. So that is a negative factor because it will take more time as there will be less reactant particles per unit volume. So that's, that's not going to increase our rate of reaction. 
Crystals of calcium chloride can be prepared by adding, uh, sorry, reacting excess calcium carbonate with dilute hydrochloric acid. Name the process used to separate the unreacted, so this is what, insoluble, from the rest of the mixture. So to separate an insoluble thing from a soluble mixture, what we're going to just use is a filter, so filtration. That's basically it. Yeah. Calcium carbonate is insoluble in water, so that, as I said here, uh, choose one other compound that is insoluble in water. So I think you're going to have to know your general solubility rules here. So let's recall them. Um, ammonium sulfate is because all sulfates are soluble except for barium, calcium, lead. All nitrates are soluble, no matter what. All chlorides are soluble except for silver and lead, I think. So this is obviously insoluble. And all hydroxides are insoluble except for sodium, potassium, ammonium. So this is still soluble. So you have to recall those but general solubility rules. And then you can do this question. Even when you're figuring out a way of preparing salts, you still have to know these rules. Okay. 7 says, figure 7.1 shows the displayed formula of compound D on what figure not for figure 7.1 draw a circle around the alcohol functional group so functional group is a group of atoms that actually determine that it's an alcohol in this case so what is the group in alcohol it's going to be oh right so we can there's a lot here we can just circle one of these over here actually that seems to be carboxylic acid so i wouldn't go for that i would go for here Yes, that's a safe bet because this is a COOH, which is the carboxylic acid group. So I wouldn't do that. Deduce the molecular formula of compound D. So we basically got to count all the carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons, hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, and then oxygens, one, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be C5, sorry, wait a minute, C5H6O5. Yes, this is correct, C5H6O5. Basically, just got to count all the elements. Explain by referring to the structure why this compound D is unsaturated. So unsaturated means it com contains a carbon to carbon bond that is obviously not a single bond. And clearly we can see here, we have over here, okay, it highlighted everything, which is not I wanted. Uh, so you can clearly see here, okay, it looks like, but anyway, you can clearly see here, right? And then you can clearly see here that there's like three double bonds actually. So the fact that there has a has a what you can just say has a C double bond. Ethene is also an unsaturated compound. Draw the displayed formula of ethene. Ethene is particularly easy. So two carbons. We can learn monkeys eat peeled bananas. This is the number of carbons. So one here, two, three, four. So anytime, anything starting with E, ethane, ethanoic acid, um, ethanol, ethane, ethene, all have two carbons. So we have a double bond here. And then carbons can only have four bonds, hydrogens only one. So that would be correct. Okay, next question says, describe a test for unsaturated compounds. You can have your aqueous bromine. You can say aqueous bromine or bromine water, but I will go for aqueous bromine. Observations, obviously, if it's unsaturated, what would it do? It would turn colorless. Do not say goes clear because that's wrong. Just say turns colorless, or you can also say decolorizes. Goes clear is incorrect for examiners. <laughs> Ethene can be manufactured by cracking larger alkane molecules. There are two conditions of cracking. So the main two would be having a catalyst. So I think it's a sulfuric acid catalyst. And then also having a high temperature. You don't have to specifically mention what the catalyst is, but just saying catalyst is enough. 
Complete the symbol equation for the cracking of dec decane to produce ethene and one other hydrocarbon. So when you're cracking, you'll get an alkene and an alkene. Since we already have an alkene here, we'll definitely have an alkene as the other product. Make sure it has to uh, be the same number of carbon, same number of hydrogens. So if you have C2 here to make C10, we have to have C8. H22 here, H4 we have to have H18. And is that an uh, alkene? Let's see, you'll use our general formula. C8, two times eight is 16, plus two is 18. So that's an alkene. So that is correct, C8, H18. Ethanol can be manufactured by the reaction of ethene with steam. Name one other method of manufacturing ethanol. So the other one, except for uh, the steam reaction with ethene, we can do fermentation, right? Those are the two, and which are commonly like we see advantages and disadvantages that are asked. Ethanol can be oxidized to ethanoic acid. Ethanoic acid reacts with sodium, just like any other acid, right? Like metal plus acid. Name the salt formed when ethanoic acid reacts with sodium. So it's going to be sodium or ethanoate. So that's how you do the ending. If it was methanoic acid, it would be methanoate, pentanoic, sorry, was it? Propanoic acid, um, pro propranoate, and then butanoic acid, butanoate. So those names are a bit hard to pronounce it. Next question says, ethanoic acid reacts with propanol. Uh, this is to make an ester, right? So carboxylic acid and alcohol. Organic product has the molecular formula C5H10O2. We have to complete this table to calculate the relative molecular mass of C5H10O2. So carbon has five atoms with the relative atomic mass of each atom being 12. So five times 12 is 60. Then hydrogens, we have 10. So 10 times one is 10. Then we just basically got to add all these numbers up. So 70 plus 32 is going to be 102. That's how you would do the relative molecular mass. This question is about nonmetals and compounds of nonmetals. Describe two physical properties which are typical of nonmetals. So these are basically opposite of what metals have. So you can say that they are poor electrical conductors and the what else can you say? They can you can say they have low melting point, boiling point, and you can say that they are poor thermal conductors, poor ductility. They are brittle, so they're not malleable. Stuff like that you can see for physical properties. Methane is a compound of carbon and hydrogen. What we what do we call that? Com uh, contains only carbon and hydrogen. We call it a hydrocarbon, right? Complete Figure eight point one to show the dot and cross diagram. For a molecule of e methane, show outer shell electrons only. So carbon has how many electrons? It has four in its outer shell. Hydrogen has one. So I'm just going to fill in hydrogen first since I know for sure there's only one they have and it has to be two in their valence shell. And they'll just be like this, completed for everything. So that was pretty easy, right? So no, uh, no lone pairs of electrons or lone electrons. Methane is an alkane, right? The general formula. So we have written that CN, H2N plus 2. Methane is an air pollutant. State one source is methane in the air. So we can either get it as um, decomposition of vegetation or from waste gases from digestion in animals, which basically means they're uh, farts. But I mean, it's Cambridge's way of making it more appropriate. So I'm going to just write decomposition of vegetation. Or you can do the waste gases from digestion in animals is also an acceptable answer. State one adverse effect of methane, that's obviously going to be global warming or climate change. Carbon particulates and water are two of the products of the incomplete combustion of methane. Name one other compound formed during the incomplete combustion of methane. So that's going to be what? Carbon monoxide. So if you have, uh, let's see, yeah, it's going to be carbon monoxide. Sulfur dioxide is an air pollutant which contributes to acid rain greatly. 
also oxides of nitrogen also do. Choose from the list the pH value that is acidic. So acidic would be anything below seven. So or the only thing below seven, um, and not seven is four. Stay two methods of reducing the acid rain. What can we do? We can install catalytic converters in cars. We get less like carbon monoxide. Sorry, uh, sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen. So catalytic converters, and we can also do. Uh, flue gas these sulfurization so no more sulfur in these which will combine with the oxygen to make sulfur dioxide so flue gas desulfurization and you can also use low sulfur fuels that's also another option so catalytic converters flue gas desulfurization and low sulfur fuels Sulfur dioxide gas turns as turns aqueous acidified potassium manganate VII from purple to colorless. This figure shows a gas jar of sulfur dioxide separated from a gas jar of air by a glass plate. A piece of filter paper soaked in aqueous acidified potassium manganate VII is glued to the top of the gas of the jar. Uh, sorry, gas jar of air. The glass plate is then removed. At first, the filter paper remains purple. After a short time, the filter paper turns colorless. Explain these results in terms of kinetic particle theory. So this is definitely about diffusion. The fact that the molecules have to actually diffuse first uh, before like getting to the filter paper. So basically what you have to do is that you have to describe what diffusion is. So first I would mention the word diffusion because that's a key word here. And then I would say about the movement of um, molecules that they collide. So movement of molecules and collision, sorry, molecule and collision. And then also about the fact that they hit the filter paper. Um, and then the most important part is that they go from a higher concentration to lower concentration. So the molecules spread from higher concentration to a lower concentration. So basically explaining the concept of diffusion by this example here. So basically what you have to mention is that diffusion, that the molecules are colliding and they're traveling, they'll hit the filter paper because they're going from, molecules are traveling or spread from the higher concentration to lower concentration. Basically that's it for three marks. And that's this paper. This was very, um, I think just mainly stuff picked out from the syllabus specifically, like all of these are just like syllabus questions, honestly. Uh, yes, so make sure you're familiar with doing dot and cross diagrams because they can be, um, even though one marks, but when you count them up, it's a lot. And this was relatively good, yes. Even knowing the displayed formulas are very important. And the general solubility rules, definitely. And yes, overall, this paper was pretty good. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave it down in the comments and our team will reach out. Um, but all in all, thank you for watching.